the uh, topic I'm going to present today is a somewhat personal one. Uh, it is something that I and my family experienced growing up uh, a great deal. We, we were taught in nearly every venue, from school to church to evangelistic meetings, that Jesus was coming very, very soon. Uh, in, in, in a fearful way, uh, Jesus was preparing to come, but before Jesus would come, there would be tremendous persecution and terrible things happening. Now, I, let, let me start out by saying I wrote about this once, and I had a couple people write to me and say, I'm sorry that happened to you, but you're the only one who's ever experienced it that way. Uh, or you're one of very few that experienced it that way. Meanwhile, I got dozens of letters from people saying, as a matter of fact, I grew up terrified of Jesus' second coming. I had no peace about it. People who told me I would lay awake at night and cry fearful that Jesus was going to come, and I wasn't ready for him. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has promoted a fearful urgency about the coming of Jesus, and I just feel that there is no excuse for this. So I'm going to start by telling you a story. Can you see the picture of the gentleman there? I grew up in North Dakota German farm community. And uh, when I say German, it was it really was German. We, we were one of those Midwestern communities that was filled with German immigrants. And uh, one of our neighbors was, uh, and at the time I was young, already an old man named Carl. And if I gave you his last name, you would recognize it because he had uh, uh, three sons who worked for the church. Uh, one that was very high up in the church, in fact, but I won't tell you the name. Uh, Carl was a, uh, I remember him as a rather a stocky, tall man with a magnificent nose. Um, he was, uh, he embodied all the qualities I associate with the German Adventist of that generation. Stern rigidity, absolute certainty of his beliefs, and even greater certainty that those who disagreed with him were wrong. Um, he had a rather pessimistic view of the world. Uh, my mother, who grew up in the same few square miles where I did and where Carl and his family lived, uh, said that when she was a child and they were invited over to the home of Carl and his family, he was such a stern Seventh-day Adventist that everybody would have to sit quietly Children couldn't play. You had to sit quietly in a stiff chair while Carl would read to them stories of martyrs and uh, terrible things that would, were about to happen, pa passages from the great controversy. And my mother said, I grew up terrified. Now this may sound shocking to you, but from growing up in that world, it doesn't surprise me that the people who taught me in Sabbath school uh, some of Carl's family, in fact, were only a short remove from that kind of fearful presentation. Now, back in the 1950s, right after the war, uh, most of the farmers had gone from the labor-intensive process of cutting their grain and moving it to a stationary threshing machine to using a new invention that was really becoming popular, the combine harvester. And uh, some of, even if you're not a farmer, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, whereas before they used to uh, bring all of the grain in, in, they called them shocks or bundles and uh, throw them into the, the harvesting machine, the, the stationary threshing machine. Now the whole threshing machine would move across the field. It was called the combine harvester. And uh, I remember my grandpa asked, it, Carl, Carl was the only one who was still looking for workers to come and uh, harvest his grain with bundles. 
And uh, by this time, that whole industry of threshing machines and such was dying out. And I remember my grandpa asked him, he said, Carl, why don't you get a combine like the rest of us? And Carl was appalled by the question. He said, with Jesus coming any day now, why should I spend the money on a combine? Well, Carl retired in the 1950s. He died. All of Carl's sons, as I said, worked for the church at one time or another, uh, two of them as pastors. Uh, about two years ago, his youngest son passed away, lifelong church administrator, age of 97. And this is not an uncommon story. If you were like me, a multi-generational Adventist, you have parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and uncles and aunts who believed Jesus was coming in their lifetime. And they were surprised when they got old and it didn't happen. Why did they think that Jesus was coming in their lifetimes? Because it was pounded into their heads at every church service, every camp meeting, in articles, in books, in Sabbath school quarterlies. The entire Seventh-day Adventist enterprise was based on a theology of urgency, fear, and sacrificial giving. If we were living in an emergency, Jesus was about to come even while we were building new buildings and churches and hiring and training more people and setting up retirement funds for people like me. I, I, I wanna make sure that you understand something very important. The foundation of the Seventh Adventist Church is a conviction that Jesus is coming soon. Now you say, oh, come on, Lauren, that's not, that's not a surprise. That's not something we didn't know. But I want you to really get this. Please fully understand. We like to say, I like to say, I like to tell, I like to tell my congregations, I said, the foundation of our church is Jesus Christ and him crucified for our sins and that he loves us and he's going to save us. I wanted to tell them that. But if you are looking at the Seventh Baptist Church historically, you must understand that that is not the heart of where we came from. That was in the mix, but it was an aside. It was a thing we happen to also believe. The foundation of the church was this conviction that Jesus was coming soon. And whenever you go back to analyze where did the Seventh Baptist Church come from, why do we believe the things that we do? Why do we act as we do? You do not go back to Jesus died on the cross for our sins. You go back to Jesus is coming soon. That is the foundational belief of Seventh Avenue. And we, any, any theological analysis that you do is going to have to involve that. Um, whenever you have a major social movement like Millerism, you have to have a way of managing the fallout. And I'm going to call it the algorithm. Uh, psychologists have called it uh, disconfirmed expectancy is another uh, word for this, but I'm gonna call it the algorithm. The fact is what they all expected and were all set up to see happen did not happen. Jesus did not return in 1844. So you had to come up with some way of explaining it. Well, you already know that part of that was that uh, there's something happened in heaven. It didn't happen on earth. We expecting it to happen on earth, but instead it happened in heaven. And the algorithm is Jesus didn't come when we thought he would, but Jesus will come soon if we. So what you have is a new expectation, but this new expectation carries conditions. And what are the conditions? Well, first of all, we must do evangelism. 
we must tell the whole world that Jesus is coming soon. We must join the one true church. There's only one church, only we are the ones. And this, this happened early on, folks. Ellen White made it very clear early on that Adventists were the only ones who had the truth. Additionally, we must purify ourselves by eating the right foods or not eating the wrong foods and a variety of other personal behaviors. The Sabbath very soon came into this mix. And make no mistake, the Sabbath, as it's described by Ellen White and by the pioneers, was the sign, the signal, the, um, the seal of God on those who were God's chosen people. We are to separate ourselves. And finally, and this is the part that uh, so many people have reacted to me about, is we must survive end time calamities and persecution. The fact is that no one can argue that two millennia have passed since the apostles said that Jesus was about to return, or that it's been almost two centuries since the Adventists renewed that claim. And yet our leaders trumpet the word soon as enthusiastically they, as they did two centuries ago. Now, eventually Adventists quit setting dates, but what we did was arguably worse we began to use words and phrases that express all the anxiety and expectancy, the urgency and fear, but with no possibility of closure. Please hear this. Soon and imminent or, or at any time gives no possibility of closure on the, on the matter. We're at the edge of the precipice, but we can neither walk back from it or, nor fall over it. We true believers are to live in existential vertigo. And for almost two centuries, we have twisted people's arms to respond to the altar call because Jesus is coming soon. We've asked them to leave all their money to the church when they die, even though Jesus had failed to return in their lifetimes as we promised them, because Jesus is coming soon. We have urged young men and now women to minister because Jesus is coming soon. And for 180 years, my denomination has purported to be in a state of emergency, all the while carrying on business as usual. Something I want to make sure that everyone understands is that I am not denying that Jesus is returning again. Don't come back at me in the, in the discussion period and say, well, you don't believe that Jesus is returning. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I'm going to give you four passages that sort of, I think, solidly outline Jesus' promise of returning. What I'm not going to give you are, is any passages that say when, because uh, that's the part that we're talking about today, the, the, the urgency. First of all, we have the familiar passage in John 14, 1 to 3. In my father's house are many mansions, if it were not short, so I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Very familiar and very, very solid promise that some way, sometime, in some way, Jesus is returning for us. How is he returning? We find that in Revelation 1, 7. Look, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him even though who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Third, we have a connection of the second coming with a kind of judgment. And I could pull up several passages here. Um, I pulled up uh, Matthew 13 to, to illustrate this. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Uh, we, God will weed out his kingdom every all of sin and all who do evil. I prefer, if I'm going to do a judgment passage, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, 
because I think it expresses what God expects of people in the judgment a little better. And that's the passage that talks about the sheep or the, and the goats and says that those who were who, who behaved with kindness toward others are the ones that he rewards with eternal life. And then finally, we also have from Paul the connection of the second coming with the resurrection. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead raised imperishable and we shall be changed. A passage that I've certainly read many, many times at funerals. But what I want to teach you today, and I, and I hope I make this very clear, is that Jesus never meant for us to live in fearful urgency. But I'm just going to go ahead and read this whole passage. I think it's important. You know it, but I still want to read it. But about that day and hour, who knows? No one. Do the angels know? No. Does Jesus know when he's coming? Apparently not. Only the Father knows. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be at the coming of the Son of Man from the days before the flood. People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Folks, I don't know how much clearer you can be than that. And you, you, say, you know, and, and I've heard people try to wiggle out of this. I've actually had people set, tell me that they set a date for Jesus to return, but they don't expect, they, they don't give the day or the hour. They only give the week or the month because that's allowed in how they read that passage. Good grief, folks, please grow up. Um, the first, <clears throat> the first evangelistic meeting that I remember going to, um, I, I remember the, uh, evangelist standing up and I, and as I recall, he used slides. Uh, you remember the little 35 millimeter slides? Um, I still have some of them around here from earlier years. And I think he had a slide projector that he used with an advanced these slides and he, and he, he, he put up on the screen, what will be the signs of the end? First one was wars and rumors of wars. What will be the signs of the end? Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. More signs again, bullet point three, famines, bullet point four, earthquakes. And he said, folks, you've got to realize this is happening right now. There, we're, we're fighting over in Vietnam, where there's fighting in the Middle East. You heard about the earthquake that happened here, there, whatever it was at that time. People are dying of famines in Bangladesh. These are the signs of the end. At the time, I took that as a fact. It wasn't until later on and I'm a little embarrassed to say this, it wasn't until I became a pastor that I read the actual words that said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, business as usual, just like in the days of Noah. The end is still to come. It's still a ways off. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But what? This is just the beginning of things, folks. This is just, this is just getting started. 
And then Luke chapter 21, and, and I've got to thank uh, one of my writers for calling my attention to, there, there's the passage in uh, Matthew 24, and then it's also a, a parallel passage in Luke chapter 21. And uh, one of my writers, a fellow from Latvia, uh, called my attention to this. Um, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claim, claiming I am he, or the time is near. Ever heard that from a Seventh Avenue evangelist or a Seventh Avenue pastor? The time is near. And what are the words that come right after that? Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. You with me so far, folks? Jesus never said to live with fearful urgency. He said, be ready. The Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And for some reason, uh, we interpret this text as meaning he will come when the world is not expecting his return. But that's how Jesus says. Jesus is speaking to his followers. He's saying that he will come when we, who are looking forward to, him, to seeing him again, when we do not expect him, not his followers, us, not, not the world, us. And yet we constantly go around saying that we're expecting Jesus next week. I, I, I have heard our church leaders rise to their hind legs at at meetings and say, we will not have another general conference session. This is the last one. Next time we're going to meet in heaven. So I'm moving on from uh, to what I consider weak and misinterpreted texts. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm not going to relitigate uh, Daniel 7 through 9 right here. That, that would take way too much time. I will only say that uh, <clears throat> a great many more people than you suppose think that the 1844 interpretation of Daniel 814 is extremely weak. If I could gather all of the Bible teachers in North America into one room, well, no, let's put them in separate rooms so they can talk truthfully. I'm going to guess that three-fourths of them, after hemming and hawing a bit, would say, yeah, that whole 2300 days, 1844 thing is pretty weak. Pretty weak stuff. They're not going to say it in front of anybody. But I, I, but, but I know them well enough, that, and I know they feel that way. Let me add this. Um, there's nothing in Daniel 7 through 9, if you would read it without the history of Seventh-day Adventist interpretation, that would make you think there was anything going on there happy, that, that has to do with Jesus' return. It's, it's not about Jesus' return. It's about the sanctuary being cleansed. I tend to think that it means the regular old earthly sanctuary after it had been uh, uh, violated and made unholy by conquering armies. Uh, I, I think that's a, a pretty solid interpretation. And I think a lot of my Bible scholar friends would probably agree with me. Uh, probably not out loud, but they would in their hearts agree with me that that's probably a stronger interpretation. Uh, the best interpretation I can put on 1844 is that it did bring Seventh Adventism into being and bring into public consciousness the notion that Jesus really did say he would come again. But there is nothing intrinsic in Daniel 7 through 9 that is about the second coming. It is about the sanctuary being cleansed with, and uh, when they thought it was about the second coming, it turned out they were wrong, and they admitted they were wrong. 
Here's another text that I think is awfully often misinterpreted. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we need not write to you, for you know very well that the, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You'll be interested to know that uh, our early pioneers struggled mightily with this text. As a matter of fact, uh, James White wrote a sermon that was that became a uh, tract, which I have around somewhere, but I couldn't put my hands on it, so I looked it up online. He wrote a whole tract, and he said uh, basically that uh, verse four made uh, gave made an exception for for the Adventists. He says, it says in verse four, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness, so this, this day should surprise you like a thief. So in other words, for you, it's not going to be like a thief in the night. You are going to know the time. All of these things about you'll never know when Jesus has come doesn't apply to us because we Seventh-day Adventists know that Jesus is, we, we, we are given permission to know when Jesus is our is going to come. Now, I think you could interpret this another way. I think you could interpret it to say that uh, we are going to be ready in the sense that Jesus asked us to be ready. We're going to be ready at all times, uh, not not specially geared up for the event. Now, I was I was thinking of a of an example. Um, I have some friends that might, maybe some of you are part of this group who would say. Oh, I love it when people drop in without calling. No, that's not my that's that's not my style, not Carmen's style. We we like to be ready for people, but so I, I have friends who who say, "Oh, I just wish people would just drop in." And uh, they're they, they're always ready for people. Are they ready for people because everything is so perfect all the time? No, they're ready for people because they're comfortable in the space that they live and they don't care what other people think when they come in and, and join them. Uh, they're kind of always ready. They didn't have to do special cleaning for a company to come because they're comfortable with, with the way they live. So that's another way of looking at it. Here's another one. <clears throat> Above all, you must understand that in the last day scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it was since the beginning of creation. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, for the day of the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some of you understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Uh, I have, when I have presented this notion of uh, not being anxious, I have been called a scoffer. And I think back through the years, let's suppose that... Uh, after the apostles were preaching for a few, few years that Jesus was coming back, uh, let's say some believer, some listener in 75 AD uh, heard that message. And he said, you know, they've been telling me Jesus was coming back for a long time now. And Jesus hasn't come back. I'm beginning to wonder if we really know when Jesus is coming back. And someone heard him say that and said, well, you're a scoffer. There was a time around 1000 AD, strong uh, apocalyptic uh, feelings arose right around 1000 AD. Uh, people were predicting the coming of Christ. Suppose some man got through 1000 AD and he said, you know, I, I, all these people telling me Jesus is coming back very, very soon. Jesus didn't come back in 1000 AD. And I'm wondering if we really know when Jesus is coming back. And somebody said, yeah, you're a scoffer. How about 1845? After the disappointment, some person said, you know, 
heard lots of preaching about Jesus returning. Jesus didn't return. I'm starting to wonder whether we really know when Jesus is going to return. And somebody called him a scoffer. Now, let's be honest here. Who of these people were the most honest? Clearly the guy who kept pointing out the obvious. Jesus hasn't returned. And 2,000 years of failed predictions prove we don't know when he's going to return. Who, on the other hand, made unkind accusations of scoffer against sincere Christians for telling the truth? Who frightened generation after generation of Baptists? Hiding the love and grace of God becomes stories of eminent persecution by our Roman Catholic neighbors. Who did that? Our leaders, our preachers, our writers, and our evangelists. The Greek word um, in this passage translated uh, evil desires or lusts means inordinate desire, eagerness, or longing. In fact, it's a wonderful thing to have a longing for Jesus. Who has a twisted, who has twisted people's love for Jesus into fearful expectancy? Who has ignored 2,000 years of a no-show Jesus, pretending that his return is still right around the corner? Our leaders, our preachers, our writers, and our evangelists. And I'm saying unto you folks, the person who says, hey, it hasn't happened yet, and I'm beginning to wonder if you're interpreting the Bible correctly when you say that the return of Jesus is imminent. That man is not a scoffer. That's a smart person making a common sense observation. And I say, stop it now. There is no longer any justification for this. Again, I am not saying that Jesus won't return. I am saying that we cannot justify the rhetoric of immediacy. Jesus never told us to live in a state of continuous emergency. He said, therefore, be ye also ready for such an hour as ye think not. The son of man comes. That's not urgency. The only way to live that way is, is living for Jesus every day, trying to be like him and trusting his power to save, just as you do when you think about your death. It is too late to say that Jesus is returning soon. We've burned that word out to the point of meaningless, meaninglessness. Soon after two centuries is a husk. It's a cinder. It's a falsehood. Is a word with no logical content. When I uh, posted that I was going to, to teach about this, I had people come on and say, oh, yes, but Lauren, you have to live always in that state of anxiety. That's what Jesus wants you to do. He wants you to be living constantly, expecting him. And I say nonsense. That's emotionally and spiritually unhealthy. I'll tell you another story. I know a woman whose father moved to, uh, uh, left the family home and moved to another country. Now she was daddy's girl, loved daddy. Daddy loved her. And dad kept saying, I'm going to come back to you soon. I'm going to come back and visit. Or if things go well, I'll send you money for you to come and visit me. We'll get together. And the fact is dad never came through. She didn't see him through her whole childhood. By the time she saw him again. She was an adult, had children of her own. And it was not just an anticlimax. She was filled with a lifetime of bitterness by that point. She had spent her life waiting for dad, and dad never showed up. She had come to realize that dad was a fraud. That waiting with no results shaped her whole personality. It shaped her relationships with men. It shaped her in how she related to people, the career she chose how she related to her children. She wasn't just disappointed that he left. She was disappointed through her entire life. And you would think that by now it would be dead obvious that to keep saying Jesus' return is about to happen soon, whether or not it's true, isn't helpful and it isn't kind. I call it the cruelty of soon. The language of urgency is the way that the Seventh Adventist Church, possibly without malevolence, but clearly with organizational intent, has manipulated its members. To pound this into people's heads has been dishonest. To embroider it with stories of Roman Catholic enemies and persecution has been cruel. 
And in fact, I'm going to say something that is bold and is going to concern you. No one really believes it. How do you know no one really believes it, Lauren? Because if people really believed it right now, the General Conference building would not be a huge uh, edifice in a uh, high-end portion of Maryland. It would be a few uh, modular units setting on concrete blocks somewhere. We keep hiring, retiring, consigned to the grave generation after generation of people who believe with all their hearts that Jesus was hiding behind the next cloud to appear in the east, half the size of a man's hand. We keep building buildings. Our leaders keep traveling the world. Our assets keep accumulating. I remember when I was a young pastor, went to a, a meeting where Neil Wilson spoke and he spent about a quarter of the meeting telling us how huge the assets of the Seventh Avenue Church were. Uh, giving numbers, uh, the, uh, part of the part of the sermon was comparing the assets of Seventh Avenue Church to uh, big Fortune 500 companies. I'll never forget it. Uh, G.T. Ng wrote, arose to his feet at the 2015 GC session just before he retired and said, we will not have another GC session. This is the last one. Well, we had another GC session. And there's another one coming up next year. Uh, GC didn't cancel his retirement account. His, GT didn't cancel his retirement account, as far as I know. Neither did Ted Wilson. I expect he's going to, he's going to retire next year. Uh, in fact, he has not only a home in... Uh, the DC Baltimore area, but he has a lovely home in North Carolina that he's going to move into. Another GC is scheduled, it will undoubtedly happen. Nobody really believes it. If people really believed it, they would act upon it, but they don't. And I'm going to instead suggest a practical and workable statement. It's time to replace Jesus is returning soon with Jesus is returning someday. And I'm going to be ready when he returns or when, if I die, I'm going to re be ready because of God's saving grace. And as for the preparing for the end times, um, I have friends, you have friends perhaps who have uh, stored up food in their basement and maybe even have a few guns around for the time of trouble. I'm going to say the only worthwhile preparation for the end times is being a thoughtful disciple of Jesus. If you read Matthew 25, he says, what you need to be, do to be ready for the judgment is uh, treat every nerdy, needy person with sacrificial kindness. And I'm going to declare today, go on record as saying that anything you hear beyond the grace of God and treating other people with sacrificial kindness is a distraction that cannot but result in disappointment. So, uh, Bob, this is my last slide. And if folks want to start raising their hands and talking with me, I'll be happy to do that. But I thought I would share a few question and top, questions and topics. Uh, this is not exhaustive, but maybe it helps somebody to get started. <clears throat> Some people say that the promise of Jesus' soon return is comforting. Others say it is terrifying. Which is it to you? Uh, to go along with that, the pioneers called Jesus' soon return the blessed hope. I think for a lot of us, it quit being a blessed hope. It became a a a, a, a cursed. Uh, distraction. Um, why, why did that happen? Here's another question. It'd be interesting for some of you. I, I know how old, or generally how old some of you are. Some of you are older than me or a little younger than me, but we know where we're at in our life, don't we? We're not, we're, we're not uh, 
we're, we're not deceived at how much how many years we have left, are we? We know. Do you expect to see Jesus before or after you die? Um, how about this one? We kept being told to look for signs. Horrible things are undoubtedly happening in the world. What do they say about Jesus' return, if anything, to you now? Has our church attached more fear and anxiety to salvation than the Bible does? I think that's a hard question. I don't think that's a, a question with a simple answer. Uh, the Bible has a lot of anxiety about the future in some places, too. Have we attached more fear and anxiety to salvation than Jesus did? How about than other Christian churches do? And finally, what is the role of Ellen White in end time anxiety? Let me see. Um, trying to figure out how maybe I can minimize that and get back to seeing all of your faces. Thank you. Thank Bob, you. That's it. that's it. Thank You're you. On. Thank you, Lauren. I think you have um, um, one sort of, I've had, I think, a number of epiphanies during this, during your presentation and from some of the comments. But I certainly I identify with you, um, parents growing up, <laughs> Christ can come any minute. If I did something wrong, like practice my table tennis on um, on the Sabbath, and they'll say, what if Christ, what if Christ came while you were actually playing table tennis on the Sabbath? So I certainly, I certainly agree with and identify with um with the issues, with the issues you raise. Um I must say also that um a number of folks in the in the chat made some very interesting points. I see we are um Gerald, and I never thought about that thought about it that way, Gerald Loft said that Loft House, he put brinksmanship, right? Um, art, I saw where Art said, the blessed hope, right? Um, George, George Titchy said that, you know, it's good for business. So I think all these aspects are bundled into the issues you raised and the, and, and your presentation. So, we will we'll um we'll begin with um Raj. Um all right, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate the presentation. You you laid it out very clearly and, and logically and courageously, and I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. here's my question. It's very simple, I think. Uh, doesn't relate to the questions you posted, but uh, would would there even be a Seventh Day Adventist Church today? Wait not for our eschatology and this this emphasis that uh, we've talked about. Uh, didn't we need it just to survive to to sustain ourselves? Would we be would we even be here? Wait not for this. Well, obviously not. Uh, the seven, I, as I said from the very beginning, the foundation of everything that is Seventh Day Adventist is eschatology. <clears throat> it is not righteousness by faith. It never was. They didn't discover that until much later on, and and that was an add-on. It was not the Sabbath at first. Sabbath only came up. What was it? A uh, 1847, perhaps when uh, when uh, Joseph Bates started. Uh, uh, talking about the Sabbath, all of those things came after by by way of the algorithm that uh, Jesus will return soon if, and uh, added on. But let me put it in a different way, Raj. When you were younger and you were brought into the Seventh Adventist Church and you were inspired perhaps by a pastor that you knew or a teacher that you loved or someone to become a pastor. I suspect that you entered with a, a sort of uh, youthful uh, attitude toward uh, what you were doing. I would imagine if we could go back and quiz the uh, Raj Attican, who just started working for the Ohio Conference uh, 40 years ago, 
we would find him having quite a different set of attitudes than the Raj Atikin, uh retired um, uh, six or seven years would have now. Am I correct? Yes, you are. <laughs> and uh, the fact of the matter is, Raj, that our church has not matured in that same way. Mm. We should be past the point. We should have, by this time, wrestled with the failure of our founding prophecy. We should, by this time, have come to be able to say, uh, Jesus is coming someday. We still, we still believe that. But we're no longer going to dangle the sword over your head constantly that Jesus is going to come tomorrow. Are all of your sins forgiven? Have you gone to everybody that you ever, ever did wrong to and asked them for forgiveness? Are you, cap are, are you going to be ready? Because just tomorrow you may look up and see a little cloud up there with the sun shining through it, and suddenly it's going to burst open and there's going to be Jesus. And I know there are people on here today who have that very experience because I've talked to you about it. That's all I'm saying, Raj. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we would never be here except for that, but we should have grown beyond that. And, and if we do change and say, yeah, Jesus is coming someday, will that be a galvanizing vision to keep us together? Well, you know, I, I really don't know the answer to that, Raj. I would have to say that if it is a galvanizing vision that is unhealthy and untrue, then I don't know that we ought to use it anyway. That, you know, there's a lot of people that have galvanizing that have galvanized people into a movement by, by means of lies. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Jesus' return is a lie, but I'm saying that the notion that Jesus is returning right now, very soon, and you should live in constant anxiety because Jesus is returning very soon. That is a lie. Yeah. Thank you. you Thank that. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's hear from let's hear from George. You raise a very interesting point that I think addresses the issue that that was just discussed with um, with Raj and um, and Lauren. He said it's good for business. So let's let's um, let's hear let's hear from him. Let's hear from George. Hey George. Okay. Hi Lauren. When you present something like this, you you know you're gonna hear from me for sure, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know that's uh, true there, right there, because, well, uh, first of all, let me say that you presented 100% of what I have believed for many years. Uh, I said probably 45, 50 years ago, I said, it doesn't matter to me when Christ comes back. He's coming back one day. The Bible is clear. Nobody knows. And now we have this bunch of Adventists saying they know. Something is wrong. And uh, well, uh, and I put it in the chat, yeah, that it has been very good for business because the more the GC scares people, uh, the more money flows in. And then uh, maybe not, not in North America, but around the world, they are doing very well in preaching the message and expanding the concepts that they are scaring people and people are jumping into the baptismal tank and opening their pockets and, and wallets. So this is a, a factor. Now, so I, I really agree with everything you said. That it's very sad that the church that we belong to for so many years just was dishonest, deceiving to us. And here we are now in a situation like this. The point is, what are we going to do? Uh, you and I have a little bit of disagreement on one point because you think that the church, or you thought at least I had the impression you, you think this, that the church is going to change. And I am 100% clear. Uh, I, I, I think that the Adventist church is not going to ever change. Ever change. We can change the way we re do our spiritual exercises and other ATSS other venues, we can change that, but expecting to be a force to change the church, that would be 
that, that's probably just what I call, sorry, but a, a kind of ma uh, mental masturbation, you see, is just having a hope or something. And that can lead, yeah, this kind can lead to insanity. I think that what we 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 can only uh, the only thing we can rely on is to one day have a church a group that is Ellen less or white less that is biblically based only in which we don't talk about Ellen White as being an authority in the church and we can be Christians again. So I could I could go for one hour on this. I wouldn't won't do it to you. You won't allow it to me. Yeah. But uh, uh, let me uh, let, let me answer that. Me? Let me answer that, George. Uh, you know, I am not invested wholly in the church changing. I'm a pastor, and as a pastor, here's what I'm invested in: I'm investing in invested in ministering to people with the peace of Christ, the grace of Christ. That's what I'm invested in. No, I would hope, I hope, I, I pray that my church could grow up a bit and become uh, much more grace-oriented than it is. When I, when I hear my general conference president standing up and, and uh, pounding off, you know, something like 30 points and saying, all of these things you must agree to, or you might as well resign from the church. I keep thinking of that uh, line that Jesus said about, you tie up burdens too heavy for people to bear. What he said to the Pharisees, you tie up burdens and put them on people that are too heavy for them to bear and you don't lift them. You just put lay burdens on people. No, I, I'm not invested in the church changing, George. I would like it to change, but here I, I am very clearly and strongly invested in ministering the grace of Christ to, to people. And I want you who are here today to understand that you don't have to live in a state of con constant anxiety, that you can know that you have eternal life, that whether Jesus comes now or Jesus comes later, and I suspect most of us are going to go to our graves before we see Jesus, that we can have the assurance of eternal life. That's where I'm at. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Robert T. Johnston. Robert, please join. Oh, I haven't seen you for a while, my friend. How are you? I'm well, thank you, and it's nice to be back. I, I'm pretty much tied up in church most Sabbaths, so it's hard to get back in time for the seminar, but uh, I had to pull away to do today to get this one, because, especially because we had an old-timey preacher preaching this morning uh, who pretty much gave that standard message you were just talking about. Yep. You know, we finished with the hymn, Hold Fast Till mm -hmm. I Come, so uh, you can picture the scene. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I nearly died on Christmas Day. I had an accident, and uh, my, my wife pulled me that. out, pulled me out of the tub where I was lying unconscious with my face down in the water. So, it oh, was, I'm uh, so sorry. Hey, I'm here. But the point is, you're right. I mean, this question, this issue is is true that for every one of us, of course, we never know when it could be, you know, our last day. And uh, I think if we could incorporate what you're saying and shift the message a little bit away from the eschatology to the, you know, the, our individual lives and the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the life and death that we all face every day. Um, I think it would, it would be helpful. Um, I think this question of fear is unhealthy and it's, but it's not dependent on eschatology or, you know, on this question of the timing of Christ's return. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it, that can be used to create fear, but fear is not dependent on that. I think about Jonathan Edwards' sermons or think about the pain, the medieval paintings of, you know, people dangling in hell and so on. Uh, fear has been used for a long, long time to try to drive conversions. Uh, and it probably wouldn't go away even if we changed the eschatology or our view of, you know, the, the, the nearness of Christ coming. But anyway, uh, you did comment on the 2015 General Conference session, which is one of only two I've ever been to. And I went specifically because I was interested in the issue of uh, the revision of uh, fundamental belief number six on creation. And um, and I, but I also was there on 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 the when when Ng made the statement that you quoted about this being the last General Conference session. And I thought, wow. And uh, but I, I'm going to tie those two together and say that. If we could adopt a a scientific view of the chronology of Earth, what did you just do? Um, 
then we would as individuals, uh, I think, be able to focus on our own lives and death timelines, because now soon would be in the context of, you know, millions and millions of years instead of 6,000. And then, you know, 2,000 years is then still very much soon. And so we could just keep the soon, but not necessarily in our timeline, but, you know, within a sort of world timeline for us as individuals, we should just be ready all the time, as Jesus said, and as the point that you made. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Robert. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, the, there is the argument that uh, a day is a thousand years, a passage that I read uh, from the New Testament. Uh, in the Lord's timeline, a day is a thousand years. Well, okay, I like that. Except when our evangelists have preached soon, they haven't meant a thousand years. <laughs> next week and they say so they say look at what's happening in the middle east how can time go beyond this year jesus will certainly come this year yet i don't see any of them divesting themselves of, of their retirement accounts uh, the fact is nobody really believes it in that respect um uh, I see Debonair her, has her hand. Debonair, it's yeah, been Debonair. so long since I've talked to you. How are you, my friend? I'm fine. I've been um, busy and haven't had a chance. I really don't have much time today either, but I did want to say that I've said it a thousand times before, and I'll say it again. Thank God for my mother. I was never ra I was raised with the idea of Jesus can come anytime. I was never raised with that being fearful. I used to be fearful for other people, and I will say here that it was the innovation conferences that Raj Atkin spearheaded in Ohio that made me start to realize, oh, you know what? Other people also love God in their own ways, and I don't have to worry about that. And then moving here to Berea and attending the multi-denominational church that I attend and discovering that people can be extremely godly people. They can be at least as godly, if not more godly than I am, and have totally different theology from me. So I have not let go of soon. I still say to God, any time now would be good on a regular basis. And the thing that I know for sure is that I will see Jesus <laughs> within 25 or 30 years. That's what I know for sure. But yes. I did want to tell a little story. I was a homeschooler most of the time. My, most of my three children's education, I did. And there, was, uh, there were a couple of periods when a school or a church I was going to would sponsor so that I could send my children to the Adventist school. And I would send him to the Adventist school. And this particular thing happened when Sally, my youngest, was seven. She came home from school and she told me she was afraid that she wasn't ready for Jesus to come. I hid my anger very nicely. And I said, why are you afraid that you won't be ready when Jesus comes? Well, Mrs. A said, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm okay. thinking we're going to have a discussion with Mrs. A. But I said to Sally, do you love Jesus? And she said, yes. And I said, did you ask Jesus to live in your heart? And she said, yes. And I said, you're ready. End mm -hmm. of discussion. I have never, I have, I've been afraid of the time of trouble. I have been afraid of, of various things. I've been afraid for people. Never, ever in my life for one minute have I oh, been afraid of the that. coming of Christ. And I am so grateful because the older I get, the more I find out how many other, and it's not so. just Adventists, it's other convention, uh, conservative groups as well, that are scared to death of doing something wrong, scared to death that if they do something wrong and die at that minute, they're lost forever. No, nope, nope, not this puppy. Yeah, you know, uh, Deb, the, uh, the Robert uh, Johnston said something about that there's more to fear than fear of the, the second coming. That's true. Yeah. Um, fear, fear has been used in various contexts about fear of being lost. Uh, I think what drives a lot of Adventists in their quest for purity, uh, eating the right foods, uh, wearing the right clothes, not what they do on Sabbath afternoon, is fear. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We're, absolutely. We're trying, and that's we're all, this, all this stuff about everything focusing on abortion or homosexuality in the political realm, same thing. The, the, but the fact right. is, Adam just then layered another layer of fear on there, Debonair. Yes. And for some of us, it was not as benign as it was for you. For some of us, it was presented very strongly. 
I told you the story of, of Carl. Uh, I remember very, very vividly when Carl's uh, daughter stood in front of my Sabbath school class and explained to us the close of probation and how terrified I was because I knew I wasn't ready. I fought with my brothers and sisters. I was a sensitive kid and I, I mean, you know, I was a sensitive kid. I wanted to go into the ministry in order to please God. And, you know, the, the, but the, the fear of Jesus coming again and the pro close of probation was a huge one for a lot of us. I, I'd be interested to know how many of the rest of you, uh, the close of probation was, was almost more terrifying than all the rest of the things that they talked to us about. Thank you, Deb. It's so nice to Thank see you. you. Give my You're greetings. Welcome. I did want to my... add that one thing you said uh, somewhere in there, you said something about that perhaps without malice. And I think that in general, that has been true. I think the church has been mistaken. I think people are scared and they say things when they're scared. But I think most of the time, not all the time, it is it has not been with malice. So I just wanted to no, say that. Before you're, I you're right, Deb. It's not it's not with malice. But as I said in the, my, uh, it it is definitely with organizational intent. Right. Yeah. I I, I uh, remember talking to an evangelist some years ago, uh, pointing out to him this this notion of uh, that when it says wars and rumors of wars, it says the end is not yet. And when it says earthquakes in di diverse, diverse places, it says, these, this is not the end of things. And he looked at me and he said, but yeah, yes, but it works so well. I'm just telling you that there was intent there. There was intent to deceive. Yes. Thank you. And, uh, Thank I have you. a hard time. I have a hard time forgiving that. But um, Deb, nice to talk to you and give my greetings thanks to Sally. Thank you. Um, I know Ed was next. Um, I don't know if he fell off the grid. Are you unmuted, Ed? Please go ahead. Yes. Ed, are you um, there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can now. Okay. I want to go back to uh, Raj's astute observation that if we took this galvanizing idea off the table, what would we replace it with? <clears throat> and somebody in the Stovall house, I don't know if it was Ray or Bobby said, I think it's time to move on. How should we move forward? Um, and I think those are two good observations. Uh, if we were to take away the idea of the soon coming of Jesus, from Adventism and just stop emphasizing that, we probably need a replacement idea. And uh, I'd just like to put forward the candidate, which each of us could adopt right now, by the way, that the kingdom of heaven is now. It's among us. And uh, that we would bend our energies toward enhancing the kingdom of heaven that is among us now. Uh, if we did that, it would bring about a real shift of our focus and energy as a group of people. Uh, if, if, that's, if that was our focus to say, how do I enhance God's kingdom on earth today? That would be a whole lot different focus than we have now. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be a healthy one. Yes. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an alternative one, Ed. Uh, if you want, to, if if you want an eschatology to live by, how about we make uh, made Matthew twenty five thirty one and following our eschatology? Jesus gathering the the sheep and the goats in one side and the other, and saying, uh, "When I was hungry, you fed me. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me." Make that our eschatology. Well, that would be consistent with what I've suggested, because when you're doing those things, you're building the kingdom of God now. Right. Yeah. Yes. So nicely. That, that, those could fit together very nicely. <clears throat> but I, I want to wind up by saying, I think our basic problem is we can't leave 1844 behind. You're right. Uh, 
the investigative judgment came out of that milieu as an alternative explanation for the wind up of the 2300 days. That's right. So we can't leave the investigative judgment behind. We can't leave the 2300 day prophecy and all of its relatives behind. We can't leave the close of probation behind. All those things which have created some dysfunctionality in our midst are associated with an event which was a failure. Correct. And we, we just can't seem to leave those behind. Uh, maybe we're fearful to leave them behind. Maybe we think we have no reason to exist if we leave them behind. Precisely. But I think as long as we're in the 1844 mindset as a group of people or as an official uh, notion, we're going to be stuck. Thank you're, you. You're right, Ed. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It, as I said, uh, as I applied the algorithm to the, the great disappointment, the algorithm is what created all the other things that came along after that. The, 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 uh, the Sabbath, the food. And the fact of the matter is, Ed, some of those things that followed in the wake of the disappointment, some of the things that were adopted are actually much better things to be interested in. Health is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Sabbath is a good thing. I love the Sabbath. Those are better things. But as you said, we keep going back to try to rationalize the disappointment, right. and it is simply not working for us. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear from David. Hey, David. How are things, hey. up, in, how are things up in BC? Oh, super wet right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, that was actually a great lead into what I wanted to say. Um, I think, yeah, we need a replacement. What I would say, though, is Adventism has it. You look at, you would go back to early Adventism. We start in 1844. It's this big eschatological drive in the midst of massive societal change. I mean, the 18, Adventism wasn't the only significant thing that happened in 1844. It was, um, a, it was a, a huge psychosocial a shift across our uh, across culture yeah yes. and we responded to it in actually fairly powerful ways but what advent what i would say sustained adventism out of that is not eschatology it's we developed a grounded practical holistic way of living we emphasized education we emphasized health we emphasized community we emphasized a willingness to question our presuppositions and innovate and those are powerful things that are still in Adventism today that we so often leave. Um, yeah, innovate. You know, the, the, uh, the, the pioneers actually had a phrase for that. They call it present truth. Yeah. It, it, you know, <laughs> whatever whatever set, setting you're living in, you should find the truth to that setting. And those who yeah. said, we've got to lock it in, uh, James White and, and the others said, no, we have to be constantly reacting through the by the spirit of god to what's happening in the world that we're living in and today we're right back we are stuck in 1844 yeah. the worst thing we can do is get up a creed and then compel people to follow it um what i would i mean what i have preached about in the past is matthew 25 I, you went there and i was like yes <laughs> because this is the thing they the disciples asked jesus what is how do we know what the when the end will come what do we do and he says it's going to come be ready and then he tells parables this is what readiness looks like take mm -hmm. care of yourself do your own things have your own oil you know invest wisely what god has given you and what does that look like well we get to the sheep and the goats and this is not what we preach but this is what adventism has that is so potent is look yes the future is uncertain uncertain things could go crazy things are crazy but this is a way you can deal with that and you can prepare to live in eternity because this is where eternity is going to be community health learning very good. Very growth good. Yeah. excellent amen Thank you. you are right amen well the problem with matthew 25 is it also has <laughs> a, a, one scarier parable in it david um the, the one of the bride and the bridegroom and uh, that one has been used uh, quite damagingly uh, in uh, among Seventh-day Adventists to say 
when in in reality all is it, all it says is don't fall asleep right it doesn't say that though it says everyone's going to fall asleep what it says is you cannot right. prepare for anyone else you're right very good because and that's the beginning of preparation you have to do it for yourself you can't bring oil for someone else and then he gets into what does preparation look like yeah 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 um, very good but yeah i agree it has been very, misused very horribly good. Thank you for Thank correcting you. me on that point. Very good, David. Thank you. Clarence, please join in. Thanks. Thank Clarence, you, Bob. How are you? Yes. Is, it, is it warm and sunny out there? Well, quite. It's a little rainy, but uh, we like it as it is there right now. It's doing. It's quite fine. Um, thanks for being so courageous. Well, I, I don't doubt your courage. I think you have it. And um, let me say, you're part of a group, part of a club that is um, that has many, many thousands, I think, of followers. So go right ahead and hold on to the point. Now, I have a, well, a theological question. Jesus said at one time, in sending out his followers, his disciples, he said, you will not have had the time to go over all the cities of Judah before the Son of Man should come, the Son of Man will have returned. And uh, that to me is a very big question. Now, I know what Peter does with it. Peter says, we saw the coming of the, of the, uh, we saw the, coming of the, of, of the king when we were on the mountain with him. And to me, Peter takes the coming to be that transfiguration. Mm -hmm. I note also that the, um, the many of the Gospels, at least the Synoptics, immediately after that saying of Jesus, they present a transfiguration. Now, my question is this. Is that a logical or even a correct interpretation of what Jesus said? It seems to me that Jesus did mean that he would be back before the others should have gone through all the cities of Judah. That's what he said. Did he mean what he said? That's my question. Well, that's a very hard question. You know, uh, uh, Schweitzer used it, who, who was uh, a bit of a skeptical theologian, Albert Schweitzer said uh, that Jesus intended to come back, but he didn't have the power to do so. Uh, his intentions were good. His, he was not able to do so. Others have said that they saw the, the uh, coming of the Son of Man when Jesus uh, rose from the grave. That's another alternative uh, explanation, not just transfiguration, but the resurrection was uh, the coming of the, of the Son of Man. What else we have to expect has been largely built on revelation, I tend to believe. As you know, Clarence, the... Um, <clears throat> The passages in uh, both uh, Luke 24 and uh, Matthew 25 are very much blended with the uh, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, yes. it's, it's impossible to pull them to, to actually pull them apart. Yeah. And uh, you could read them purely as the destruction of Jerusalem uh, without ever bringing the second coming into it. We have we have chosen not to. We have chosen to believe that that they, they are eschatological passages. Uh, so it's the, the only way we can come up with what we have is to, to really bolster it from bits and pieces and from revelation, which I find, I, I don't have a lot of trust, Clarence, and a lot of interpretations of revelation I've read, just to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, you make, you, you make a very good point. Clearly, Paul and the disciples thought that Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. Isn't that true? Yeah. Yes. Certainly. Ellen White thought, thought Jesus was going to come in her lifetime. Uh, my grand, my great grandpa, and my grandpa and grandmas, all four of them, thought Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. My parents thought Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. None of them saw any. Not only not Jesus, but they never saw any of the things that had been predicted, the persecution, the Sunday laws, all of those things. None of those things ever happened. Could it be that we're all supposed to think that Jesus will come 
in our lifetime. Could well, it be? But but I'm what I'm saying to 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 you in my presentation, Clarence, is that that is not a healthy way to live. It is not healthy. I, I, the, the story I I intentionally told you the story about the young woman whose father promised that he was going to come home, and how she grew up grew up in bitterness and hating men because her father was a no-show. And I think there is an inherent unhealthiness in living anxiety, living in anxiety, waiting for Jesus to come. It is not good for us. Okay, let me ask this. Can there be positive expectancy? You say that it's almost it's almost always negative expectancy. Can we have positive expectancy? Yeah, it was there an eschatology without anxiety? Yeah, I mean, as I said, there there are, are uh, homemakers who love having people drop in because they're ready for company at any time, and I kind of think that's what Jesus is talking about. Uh, that that is a, a positive uh, sort of feeling to feel like anytime Jesus comes, and I have to say that that's where I am in my life. I I, I do not spend a moment wondering whether. Jesus is going to save me. I gave up on that. Uh, I know I have eternal life. I know I'm very, very imperfect, but I trust in the grace of Christ, and I'm trying to be the best person I can. Uh, so yeah, that's positive expectancy. I have confidence. I have daily confidence that God is good, and God is going to save me. Uh, I don't particularly expect Sunday laws and my Roman Catholic neighbors to persecute me, and that was all part of the same package. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Lawrence. Good question. Sherry. Thank you. Sherry. Hi, Lauren. Uh, thanks for a lovely presentation this afternoon. Um, I'm going to share a few experiences that I've had uh, with the topic. Um, and then I'm going to ask a question uh, when I'm done, because I'm really concerned about how we can pull all of this together to actually live better lives. Um, but growing up, uh, my family, uh, we grew up in Montego Bay, which is uh, the second city in Jamaica. But uh, as based on all of the, the things that you had heard, we had identified a plot of land in very rural St. Elizabeth um, in a town that not many persons would have heard of called Kilmarnock. I'm sure, I'm not sure if any of the other Jamaicans have heard of that town. Oh. And that is where we would go uh in the time of trouble so we've had that identified um and and things like that and so that was a reality um for for me growing up um and when like many of you i was worried about my probation being closed i spoke to one of the elders and he said that if you're still worried about it it means your probation has not yet closed so you're good uh, and so I, I you know, encourage that it's it, as long as you're still anxious about whether or not probation is closed, you're fine. Um, so and I have friends. The, same with the uh, the unpardonable sin, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so and the, the sad reality is, I have friends who continue to live their lives um, like this with that kind of anxiety. They've adopted, you know, the country living philosophy, and they've moved to very rural communities and segregated themselves um, based on that kind of a teaching. And it pains my heart um, mm -hmm. for them. Um, uh, but in response to Raj's question about whether or not the church, if the church was to adopt um, a view that Jesus is coming someday, and then we would, we would need to change the entirety of how we operate. Um, and because, But the church is so steep in being heavenly minded rather than doing earthly good, that if we're to call members to focus instead on being good humans and genuinely replicating the principles that Christ taught, and in line with what Ed said, you know, living as citizens of heaven now. Um, and, you know, as you had said, you know, Lauren, looking at Matthew 25 as, as our guide, uh, but that would require such an overhaul that I'm not sure if that kind of a change could happen even in my lifetime uh, or indicators of success would need to change. So we couldn't look at how many persons are baptized and how much money is being collected. We would now need to start looking at how many lives are being improved, how many people because of Adventism are living a better quality of life. Um, 
it's kind of like getting an aircraft carrier to turn around. Uh, mm -hmm. It would happen very, very slowly and would require Very slowly. serious, serious will from, from our leadership, which I, I don't see uh, because they've found such success based on the indicators right. in the way right. things happen now. Yep. Um, so coming now to my question, Lauren, one of my favorite pastors, I had spoken to him about the issues that I was having. And he said that if all the people like me who see the need for change in the church, if all of us leave, then there would be no hope um, for change. But I don't think I have the patience um, to remain a part of the body and try to inspire that sort of a change. And that's what I'd like your thoughts on, you know, remaining a part of the body, trying to inspire change. Is it as hopeless as I think it is? Uh, yeah, I think it probably is. Um, I don't think the church wants to change, but you know what? I'm not trying to change the general conference office. I'm, I'm trying to provide hope and comfort for the 150 people who attend the Adventist Day Sabbath Seminar and uh, I, when I when I retired, I transferred my membership to the most liberal church I could find. And I call myself a liberal because um, that expands that that sense of of uh, being liberal means that I expand the space of the people who I can include in in my life ministries. I don't, the most happened is narrow, want to narrow that down. Only, only the good people, only the perfect people, people with the right, uh, the right ideas, the right beliefs. No, I want to expand. I want a broad church. I want a big church. I want a church that has atheists in it. I want a church that has uh, gay people in it. I want a church that has all these people in it because I truly believe that the church is the, the huge body of good people that, whether they know Christ's name or not, they, they still are God's people. As far as, uh, as staying to change the church, Cherry Ann, that's up to you. I've said the same thing to people. Why don't you stay and help make the church what you want it to be? But then I've seen people in the church be so damn stubborn that you just think, how on earth could, could if I was a young person and I was trying to to, to work in this setting with such critical, angry people. I don't know if I could do it either, Cherry Ann. I just don't know. I mean, he, you know, here we are. We're, we're not even in church. We're, we're on a, an alternative church today. I just That don't, is a very big blessing, Lauren. <laughs> I, tell I you. just don't know if I could do it. I just don't know. I, I, I have seen such such horrible treatment of people in the church who think differently than, than, than I do, or that, it, you know, it's just critical, mean. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Terry, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I wish you could stay and make your church what you want it to be, but I understand if you can't. All right, thanks, Thank Lauren. Yeah, Doc Johnston, how are you, my friend? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Um, is, is Madeline doing okay? Uh, better, but uh, she could do, uh, would be better if she did better yet. Yeah, um, I, talked to, I talked to Beth this week about her, our church down in Glendale. We had a nice visit. She's a wonderful woman. Yeah, we're proud of Beth. Um, I have a couple of observations and then a, a question, a real question. Sure. Um, I think to a large extent, we're all reacting against our upbringing. Yes. Uh, I happen to have been born into a family of unbelievers. My father was an atheist until he died. And uh, my mother was a, uh, had, been, had been raised a, a Baptist, but uh, had left it long behind. Um, I think you've already partly acknowledged that your indictment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is also an indictment of the first century Christian church, which was thoroughly eschatological. And uh, one of the most important Old Testament chapters in the New Testament is Daniel 7. It's out of Daniel 7 that you get the uh, uh, Christ's favorite uh, self-designation, Son of Man, 
-hmm. You get the judgment. You get the kingdom of God. You get the uh, saints of the Most High. Uh, Daniel 7 was a very, very important chapter for the... Uh, for Jesus and for the New Testament writers. Also, uh, they had to find a rationalization for the fact that their leader was crucified. Uh, so uh, you're, uh, you're, you're really raising in doubt. Uh, uh, and of course, Christ's initial uh, message when he begins his ministry was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm -hmm. And the very same passage where he says, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the kingdom of the angels of heaven, nor the son of man. He, uh, he follows that by saying, it'll be like in the days of Noah. Yeah. Now, and you know the rest of that. Now, here's my question. Is fear never healthy? Is fear never justified? I remember driving through Nevada in my college days and seeing all the roadkill all along the highway there. It's a, the, Nevada is a pretty empty place, but uh, there was lots of roadkill along the road back in those days, which represented a, a deficit of fear, a fear deficit. So that's my question. Um, uh, you, you use the word anxiety, but is fear never justified? That's the question. Oh, I don't think it's a very good question. Of course, fear is sometimes justified. I'm trying to make a distinction here between what between real fear and artificial fear. And what we have been fed has been an artificial fear. It has been it has been uh, monsters under the bed. It has been boogeyman in the closet. Uh, I I I have many many stories about this. I, I remember driving by. Uh, neighbor's house and my mother saying uh, those are the Catholics uh, wonderful people just warm kind wonderful people she said, they're Catholics they're going to be persecuting us at the time of trouble oh that's just a little kid and already these things had been implanted into me as they had been implanted into her these were artificial fears these people never did any harm to us uh, we shouldn't have expected they would ever do any harm to us I, I talked to a, a, a guy from a uh, from Nigeria some years ago, um, a Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, uh, I said, you know, all the, all the things going on in the northern part of your country where the Christians and the Muslims are at war and burning each, other, either, each other's uh, buildings and uh, taking each other hostage. I said, are you ever afraid of that? I said, you know, the Bible talks about a time of trouble. This seems like a time of trouble for you. You know what he said to me? He says, no, this isn't the time of trouble. The time of trouble only counts when it happens to a Sunday law in the United States of America. <laughs> and I'm thinking, seriously, you can't even use the Bible's legitimate anxieties to give you comfort in your own times of persecution when it's happening right around you. You have to say no. You, it's got. We got to wait till we see it happening in the United States. That's artificial anxiety, Bob. Uh, it's it's telling people to be afraid of things that they don't really be afraid of. Be afraid of real things. Be afraid of be be afraid of what's happening in the Middle East. Yeah, some bit something big could happen there. Be a, be afraid of dictators taking over the United States of America. Yeah, that, that's real. And be afraid of real earthquakes and real storms. Uh, be, be afraid of the real uh, robbing of our of our uh, religious liberty. Don't be afraid of things that are not happening. Well, wait a minute on that. Uh, people are predicting that part of California is going to break off and fall into the Pacific Ocean somewhere uh, around the uh, San Andreas Fault. Uh, people are predicting all kinds of horrible things that could create anxiety, but they're not necessarily irrational. They're not happening now, mm -hmm. but they're predicted. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I would say you probably should be more afraid of an earthquake in California than you should be afraid of Sunday laws. You're right. There are things to be afraid of. 
if I if I had lived in Paradise, California, a couple of years ago, and somebody had told me, uh, you know, you guys really ought to be a little more afraid of uh, widespread uh, brush fires and forest fires than you are. Uh, yeah, I'd, I think I, I would probably be left with a very healthy fear of fire. Um, I have been through my whole life. I have been told that the Sunday laws were coming. I have been told that the Catholic, Catholics are going to persecute us. I've been told that the Pope was going to have a strong hand in the events. I've been told that the that probation was going to close. None of those things have happened, Bob. And I and. Uh, at this point, they're not at the top of my list of fears. Thank you. Emmanuel? Hi, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I, has he disappeared? I think he's on mute. Where's Emmanuel? I see Richard. I see Art, I see Terry and Sandra, Linda. Uh, Emmanuel has been unmuted. Where are you, Emmanuel? Please join in, Emmanuel. Okay, well, let's go. Let's, if he, let's, he, to Richard. He, let's go to Richard. Hey, Richard, how are you? Good morning. Um, Where are you from, I, Richard? Bellingham, Washington. Oh, good. Nice to, nice to hear from you. I've got a lot of friends up in that area. Great place. Um, appreciate your presentation. I resonate with much of what you've said about your experience growing up. Um, mine was not dissimilar. It's interesting, though, that beside me is my wife from Norway, who tells me that those things were just not part of her experience growing up Adventist in Norway. It, it, a lot of cultural has to do with what we've experienced. Yeah. But I want to support what you said historically. In 1981, um, the Lord of the U.S. Air Force felt I should defend the free nation um, from the middle of Missouri. And, and, and there I went to a small church and did a inventory in preparation for a sermon I had to preach. And some of the questions from 1981 are somewhat revealing. I want to share three of those in support of what your experience was. In years, I believe the Lord will return to earth in less than one, five, 20, 10, 100 years. Five said sometime, but the average of the 22 had an answer, it was 19 years. That was in 1981. Yeah. Didn't quite <laughs> happen. But the more interesting things among that congregation, within the last year, the days I have spent without sinning number at least 0, 1, 5, 10, 20, etc. Um, one was 365. There were 17 zeros, but eight had an average of 90 days sin free. Whoa. I want to that's meet the people. That's the expectation that were placed upon our generation of Adventists way back when. Yep. If we're not living a sinless life, mm -hmm. we can't save God from his dilemma. And Jesus can't come. And we had about 20 years left to get it done. And so people were striving to do that. But then the tragedy is question number six here. I am certain that if I died right now, I would await saved in heaven. 12 people believe that three did not answer and 16 said no. So that's the, that's the, in the middle of the country, Adventism, where your experience was colored my people come from and colored at mine as well. So you're not blowing smoke when you express these concerns. Yeah. Yeah. But I think yeah. the church has matured. We've come a ways. You don't hear that stuff anymore to that extent. That's all I have to say. 
Well, I, I would say, Richard, that you don't hear it where you are, perhaps, and uh, th there are pro probably other places where you don't hear it. Um, I, I will say this, people, a lot of people, a lot of you, perhaps, are unaware that there's a vast number of churches across the middle of the country that are still preaching a theology and still living a theology of about 1955. And there are a lot of these churches across the middle of the country that to when the pastor isn't there, they tune in and show a YouTube video of Doug Batchelor telling them that women shouldn't be in ministry and they shouldn't wear jewelry. Uh, this is this is not uncommon, Richard. It is it is in fact quite common. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and mute a few people. There is some feedback here, Bob. Um, so yeah, what uh, one of my dreams is that we could more widely uh, have availability of gospel oriented sermons for these churches so that they don't have to depend on the far right radical fringe of people i know seventh avenue churches right now here in ohio that show walter Bythe videos um, some of the most extreme conspiratorial baloney that you can you can find but they do it so yeah thank you very much richard it, it is shocking when you think about it Mark? Uh, yes, hey, Mark. thank you. I, um, when my parents were getting were aging, getting older, I used to visit them quite often, and I noticed that their mail often contained uh, come-ons from various, these happened to be political groups, because they had made the mistake of donating a couple of times to some groups. And they were of a particular political bent, and uh, I'm not going to say that it doesn't happen from the other side as well. But these mailings didn't weren't of the type that said, you know, uh, we can really make things better, and your contribution will help make things better. No, what they did was they emphasized how the other side needed to be stopped, and they were bringing all kinds of horrible things upon us, and. We need your money because if we don't get your money now, we can't block these people from all these horrible things that are about to take place. And their message, the message from these political mailings were be afraid, be very afraid. That's not only done in political circles. And we've been talking about one of the ways it's done in a religious circle that we were all raised in. Be afraid, be very afraid. Probation's about to close. You could be lost. Yeah. You could be lost forever. It isn't just something you're going to miss out on. It's not like missing out on an ice cream cone. It's missing out forever. And not only that, you're going to burn for a while until every sin of yours is purged. And when that sin is purged, that just means you get to die. Yeah. You don't get rewarded. Yeah. So the church has a marketing plan just like those political groups. And that marketing plan has been the same since yeah. William Miller introduced it in another, yeah. uh, in another setting before there was a Seventh-day Adventist church. And that was be afraid, be very, very afraid. Yeah. And the pioneers of the church, when it was proven that William Miller was dead wrong, something he admitted himself, they weren't satisfied with that. No, they reinterpreted the plan. They reinterpreted the message. And that wasn't good enough either, because then they said not only was it reinterpreted, uh, okay, William Miller got the, re the, the ultimate thing wrong, but if you, did, if you rejected his message, which, by the way, means you were right, if you rejected that message, you cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. you, if you didn't accept a wrong message, you can't be saved. Does that doesn't that stand logic on its head? And then as they developed into additional teachings, the Sabbath is a good example. It wasn't enough to say, you know, there's a real blessing in keeping the Sabbath, taking a day off and contemplating important things, perhaps things about God. That's not good enough. Ellen White taught that if you once accepted the Sabbath truth and then turned your back on it, you cannot be saved. 
Those are her words. You cannot be saved. Wow. Be afraid. Be very afraid. You know, one of the things that, and I not don't subscribe necessarily to a lot of the views I may talk about here, but one of the, the great sins apparently that Lucifer engaged in was I will, he had this attitude, I will be like the most high. I think that can be, be applied to others as well. You know, you mentioned the the uh, ver the verse in Malachi about uh, uh, will a man rob God? When was the last time you heard a religious leader stand up and talk about that phrase and say something along these lines? You know, one way you could you could help the uh, the uh, cause of God would be to donate to Doctors Without Borders mm -hmm. or to the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Never. It's always donate to my organization. Talk about arrogance. Isn't that, I will be like the most high? I'm God's sole representative on earth. Donate to me or donate to my group. It is a supreme arrogance uh, to take that position. I I listen, I've mentioned before, I listen to follow not as often as I probably should have, but I listen often to the Mormon Stories podcast. And one of the, an idea that's been introduced in that as they've talked about people who've left the Mormon religion or the LDS faith is a psychological term that I was not familiar with. And I'm no psychologist, but it's a term called scrupulosity. And I looked the definition of it up. Scrupulosity is a psychological disorder primarily characterized by pathological guilt or obsession associated with moral or religious issues that is often accompanied by compulsive moral or religious observance and is highly distressing and maladaptive. I'll leave it at that. You know, I'm aware of scrupulosity and have read some about it. Uh, you are absolutely right. You are also absolutely right that... Uh, uh, fear is uh, our marketing is the church's marketing plan and uh, fear is backed up and, and I think you would have to say backed up by loyalty. Uh, loyalty seems to be extremely important right now. Uh, and uh, fear often follows from loyalty. So yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Uh, Bob, give me a moment here. I want to call attention to a couple of, uh, of the notes in the chat. Uh, Carolyn Jarnas said, uh, there's a text that says people are telling us that as soon we should not follow them. That's in Luke chapter 21, I believe. If you want to find that, it says, it, it says, if somebody says the time is near, you should not follow them. Karen Katoski said, I had a Papua New Guinea address write to me from Papua New Guinea, asked me if there's persecution going on. He was wondering uh, whether we were being persecuted here so he could get prepared in New Guinea. I told him there's religious persecution going on for Christians all over the world, China, the Middle East, and so forth. The poor fellow was waiting for the persecution to happen in the United States to American Adventists. As I said before, as, as I talked to the African guy, it only counts if it's happening to us, not if it's happening there. Somebody else asked about... Uh, Mary, May, Mary Kay Silver, Mary, Mary Kay McLeod's book, Now. Um, I was also raised with that book. It was read to us. We were, Deborah, it was, Deborah, I don't know if you're still here. Uh, it, it was endorsed by Fortis Dedimore in the introduction to the book. I wrote that part of that uh, had to do with my, uh, I wrote about Now in my dissertation when I got my doctorate because it was part of the, the stories that I was following up on um, or, or on how people reacted to time of the end. And yes, that was taught to a lot of us. Uh, Mary Kay is a friend of mine. I talked to her on, um, we, we emailed to one another and I hope, uh, I, I have met her in person in the past and I, I hope perhaps, well, I'll get to see her again. She and her husband are retired in North Carolina. Uh, it's interesting. She talks about now, but I have never heard her say explicitly, I renounce what I wrote there, but it's very clear that she is no longer a believer in the Seventh Adventist Church. So I suspect 
she she uh, is not particularly proud of it at this point in her life. But I'll need to ask her that sometime. Okay. Um, Thank so you. So, Bob, I'm sorry. I just wanted to fit in a couple of those comments, if yes. you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, Terry, he's on you. Hi, Terry. Uh, good morning, Lauren. Uh, where, are you, know where, where are you from, Terry? Oh, I don't know whether to say good mo morning or good afternoon to you guys. Uh, I'm from uh, uh, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Oh. Um, it's uh, just after six o'clock here this morning. Well, thank I've you for getting up so early. I appreciate yeah, I've been it. With you since, I've been with you since 4.30. I can see some of my friends there from uh, another group we have in Queen, in uh, Australia, Terry Dunder and George Ticci and and uh, Linda Nottingham. Um, I really just tuned in to, um, we've talked a lot about culture on uh, the group that I'm with lately. I'm just sort of tuned in to see what the American psychic uh, is like in comparison to the Australian psychic. And what did you um, discover? Oh, well, I'm still discovering. I'm still discovering, Lauren. Um, I really appreciate your presentation, Lauren, this morning, and I appreciate your articles that uh, often appear in uh, Adventist today. So uh, that's another reason I've sort of tuned in, and my wife is by my side, but she's not uh, She's not appearing. Uh, so that's okay. We uh, we are looking uh, primarily, I guess, at this, uh, this word soon and how it's... Uh, yeah. Um, how it's interpreted and um, according to uh, last um, quarter's uh, adult Sabbath school program we, Sandra and I are the unreached um, we didn't come into the church with a heritage at all although we've been um, um, members uh, for well, since the 1970s but in the 1970s when we came into the church I just uh, um, been come out of the army. I was a soldier with the Royal Australian Artillery, um, and we decided to be a little bit more religious than what we were. Uh, we were brought up at Church of England, but uh, we were taught that um, Jesus was coming soon. Do not. We'd just been married. Do not have children. Jesus is coming soon. He will be here by 1975. Mm -hmm. Do not have children. Uh, we were told by the people, the pastor that was um, studying with us um, that Jesus was coming soon. We were fearful that we weren't ready and we wanted to get ready, but we had some hesitations. We had some questions which were never answered. Um, and the final night that we had a discussion, the pastor brought along another pastor, the big guns, and used the word Terry and Sandra, do not procrastinate. I did not have a clue what the word procrastinate was. Hmm. Uh, I do now. Um, but it was referred to off times in that discussion. Do not procrastinate. Yeah. Um, I went to Avondale College or Avondale University. My lecturer was Dr. Des Ford, uh, where I gained a lot of information. The last 10 years of Dr. Des Ford's um, life he didn't live very far away from us, uh, about a 40-minute drive. He was a very, very close friend of ours, especially to my wife, Sandra. We walked and talked with Des often when we were able to visit him, and we visited him often. Um, but the question I want to ask you is, um, is this. I've written it down, and of course, when you write and try and listen at the same time, um, you said these words, and I just want you to clarify them for me, and I, I, mm -hmm. I've heard other people say them as well, as well. You've talked about, you've said, my president, in reference to Ted Wilson, my church, in reference to the Seventh-day Adventist church, I am a pastor, and I believe there's probably lots of other pastors there as well, I'm un uncertain. Um, in response to your presentation, and the soon coming, the soon coming of Jesus. Why do you still call it my church? And how invested are you? I'm not, I'm not targeting you necessarily, Lauren, but everybody that's listening. How invested are you in your church? 
Mm. I no longer call myself a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a bit like George. I call myself a Christian. I have a lot of things to be thankful for, for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I wouldn't be, I've been a, I've been a, uh, you would call an elementary teacher, um, a primary school teacher for the last 45 years. I was the principal of an Adventist school for five years. Um, I think their church could have done a lot of good things. I have a lot of good things to say about it, but I'm not invested in it anymore. Mm. We are fear free. Sandra and I just, she just said to me, we are fear free. So what yeah, would be your I, response or others response? To probably, how invested you, you are know, in your It's probably the hardest question that I have to answer, Terry. I get it uh, from another, I think another friend of your probably Peter Beach. Um, and Peter and I have chatted about this and I've chatted about it with, with art and with others. Um, I probably, I, I probably misspoke when I referred to Ted Wilson as my president. I, I think I said, I, I usually say the president of my church, but it is similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, what you need to understand, Terry, and this is hard. Th this is a, a nuanced thing to explain. The Seventh Adventist Church, whether I like it or not, is a family to me. I go back five generations, and there are some generations after me. Uh, am I invested in its long-term survival? I'd have to say, in my heart of hearts, probably not. As in, uh, probably not as much as a lot of people are. What I am invested in is these dear people that I ministered to and who I love. And uh, it's hard for me to just kind of pull myself away and say, oh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't mean anything to me anymore. No, I'm, I'm still, I, I still feel a need to minister the grace of Jesus Christ to these people who I have nurtured and preached to and loved if if the church suddenly came along and said we don't need you anymore, um, we want to get rid of you. Nobody has ever said that. I don't think I would. I, I don't think I would grieve unduly. I would still continue to be uh, invested in the the, the people. Uh, you, you, I, I'm not sure that Peter. You know, you had a different experience than I do. You and Sandra had a different experience than I did. I'm not sure that I could ever completely pull it out of me. Uh, it, the, all of my friends are Seventh Adventist or ex Seventh Adventist. And, you know, I don't really care if they're current Seventh Adventist or ex. I, I love them the same. Art Clem has been my friend since I was a young person. And, uh, I love him the same, whether he's a member of the church or not. Uh, Gerald Lofthouse is my friend through art. And I really just think the world of Gerald. And he's still a Seventh Adventist. So, you know, what? I don't know, Gerald. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all part of this, this thing. And it's hard for me to extricate myself from it, Terry. Uh, do, 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 do I really care what happens to that building in Silver Spring, Maryland? Not that much. Do I care what happens to the people inside of it? I mean, I love them as, as fellow human beings, but if, if the structure should collapse, I guess I, I would survive just fine. It's hard to say. It's, it's hard, a really hard question. It's one of the hardest questions I have to answer, Terry. Does but that no, help? I, I, yeah, I, I understand. I, I think I understand, Lauren, uh, that... You know, you, your life has been, and others have been, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Where yes. have not. But in saying that, I, I still, uh, Sandra, I still have membership. Uh, we don't often tend. My wife is a very, very good preacher. Uh, she doesn't like me saying it, but she does. And from time to time, she will take one or two sermons at our little local church. Uh, the other people. The other people that I'm concerned with, and I'm, you've said similar, these are the people who 
open up their Sabbath school lesson uh, during the week and read it. And I've read it too. And I go, I just gasp. Sometimes they're very good. Sometimes they're very bad. Yeah, yeah. I worry that they are filled with fear. The Psalms, the series of the Psalms is, dare I say, interesting. <laughs> um, but I understand that you have generations uh, of history. Um, I would do no other than what you're doing yourself. Yeah. I would well, thank you. Other. I, I will. Yeah. I will say this, uh, Terry. I have ceased in my old age to be particularly doctrinal. And so, when people say, "How can you continue to be a, seven, a Seventh Day Adventist when the Seventh Day Adventists say thus and so?" I just kind of shrug. I say, you know, what the Seventh Day Adventist Church says about that particular doctrine. Let's say the sanctity of Ellen White. I just kind of say, eh, I don't really care. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not going to divide myself from. If, if uh, I know Gerald Lofthouse to be a good and godly man, and if he holds a different doctrine than I do, I'm not going to divide myself from him because of that. It's just. It just doesn't matter that much to me, and I hope he feels the same. Uh, it's a. I feel it is a mark of maturity to say that Gerald and I don't have to agree to love one another. And if someone would say, uh, you have to agree to have the same doctrine as I do, I would regard it as a mark of their immaturity. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I, think that, I th think that is so, so good, Lauren, because I think we've said it many times, Sandra and I, when in discussions is, we need to be tolerant of everybody's opinion and be free to say what we want to say without fear of uh, church persecution against ourselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are many things we can say on this forum and the forum that I belong to uh, in Queensland, oh, sorry, in New South Wales, well, it's uh, New South Wales, I'm in Queensland, but um, that we could not say in our yeah. church Sabbath school classes or from the pulpit because just because we couldn't say it we would what we what we believe would not be tolerant tolerated yeah. but it's good that you're referring to gerald and i can see him there up in the corner um i don't know him at all uh of course but this seems like a very tolerant group of people uh be you americans um we're aussies um it just it just seems so good that we can we can converse and say stuff and nobody really goes well okay that's yeah per well, point to finger but well, thank, thank you thank, thank you very and thank you very much i'm going to get off because I, well, I read the blurb and said don't take too much time but i have i'm sorry thank you uh, yeah thank yeah you. you're, 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 you're you. disobeying our rules oh <laughs> we're sitting against <laughs> our you. rules no i uh, thank, thank you terry and then i'm looking forward to uh, someday I'll, I'll i'll we'll see sandra and let her show her face too bye-bye thank you uh, let me thank see you. Who's next? Um, Linda, um, uh, Emmanuel fell off the grid um, a few speakers ago, so we'll just allow him and then Linda will be next. Hey, Emmanuel. Yes, thank, you. thank you, everyone. It's a very strong courage you have to come and talk about this on the line. But I think we have a problem, a huge one. Who last night, problem? I, last night I was listening to Ted Wilson all fast, all fast, all fast. If you don't like it, leave. If you don't like it, leave. I think if my memory serves me well, I read somewhere, come, let's reason together. Come, yes. let's reason together. So what does that mean? Come, let's reason together. Move, get out. If you don't like it, Get out. But we have another problem too. Because we say, but Jesus will be there. It's our fault because we did not do what we were supposed to do. If we had done what we were supposed to do, we'd be home a long time ago. So now we are in the middle of a drama, if not a trauma. That's we right. create some problem, psychological problem to people. Oh, it's my fault. We have a guilty trip now. So I think we are between a hammer and a hard place. 
how to solve the equation, I am not sure I have the solution to the problem. Well, uh, Emmanuel, you notice that I, I did that slide uh, that I called the algorithm. And the algorithm is Jesus will return soon if we do the following meet the following conditions. And that has been the algorithm on which the church has continued to act. I simply do not agree at all with Ted Wilson when he says those sorts of things. They are cruel, they are unkind, they are excluding. It puzzles me so much that there are people in the church who will say, get out, we don't want you. Our church is perfect without you, just leave. The whole, the whole concept of the shaking. You are being shaken out, and I'm glad to see the back of you. And the president of this church stands up and says that. I don't agree with him in any way. What he talks, how he addresses that is cruel and unkind. And all I can tell you is that nobody is going to be told, get out, because you don't agree with me and the Abbott's Day Sabbath Seminar. And I wish we could reach farther and farther and farther with the message of inclusion. Uh, it is what I believe in. I, as I said before, I don't go with the algorithm. I believe in a broad, what the, what the Episcopalians call a broad, broad church. I want, I want to make as many people as possible welcome in, in whatever constitutes a church. I want people to feel welcome here. And I don't care if they're atheists, backsliders, uh, gay people, sinners, whatever. Uh, the broad church is what Jesus Christ uh, invited us into. Thank you, Emmanuel. I appreciate that. It's a really good point. Uh, let's hear from Linda. Hi, Thank Linda. You. Hi. Hi. It's good to see everybody today. Lauren, I don't have a question, but um, I'm going to throw a little gasoline on your fire, and I'm sure you're oh. going to want to comment on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> Uh, some people know that I co-teach an adult Sabbath school class and have done so for quite a while. And in the teacher's quarterly, you know, this is the Psalms that we're studying now. Right. On the very back page, it tells you what the subject is going to be the following quarter. Right. Uh, and so for those of you that might have held out hope that there was a possibility that things might change, I have to burst your bubble. Uh, and in fact, this is something I have never seen before. I've Some of you know I'm an ancient person. I've been a baptized Seventh-day Adventist for more than 65 years. And this is what the next quarter is going to be. And I've never seen this before. The great controversy theme as prophecy reveals it, well, we've seen that before. Here's what's different. Well, it's written by Mark Finley, which should be a clue, big clue. And this is what it says. What they're gonna use to write for the, for the, the, the clarification and all of the fodder that's gonna be provided to what Mark Finley is writing is that it says, thus we will use the great controversy by Ellen White along with the Bible. So now for the fir first time I have ever seen it, Ellen White's book, which we know is, and, and I, this, is a, this is something that nobody has mentioned in this context about this discussion, this wonderful discussion is relevance. And in my personal view, the book, the Great Controversy might have been relevant in 1880, but I don't personally view it as relevant today. But now we see that whether you agree with that or not, we now see that it is being put ahead of scripture as yes. a means. <clears throat> so that's all. Great Controversy. Uh, th this is, this is uh, I have been hearing from my friends in Europe, particularly some of you, there's a few Europeans on here. And I've been hearing from the friends in Europe, particularly saying they're extremely upset with this. There are a couple of uh, conferences or unions over there who actually write their own Sabbath school quarterly because they, they're so upset with this sort of thing. It is, it, it is simply inexcusable to use the great controversy in place of scripture, Linda. Agreed. And uh, it's going to, uh, you know, you said you're going to throw some gasoline in the fire here. Uh, they're, they're throwing gasoline in the fire by doing this. Now, when I asked Cliff Goldstein about that, he says, no, 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 it's still going to be the scripture. It's not going to be 
the themes of the great controversy, but the way they expressed it and the way they described it sounds like the great controversy comes first. Uh, there was an Aunt Sevy about, I don't know, six, eight months ago, uh, where uh, Aunt Sevy replied to the questioner whether we re believed in scripture, uh, said, no, as a matter of fact, we put two things ahead of scripture. We allow the writings of Ellen White to interpret scripture, and we allow the general conference in session to be the highest authority of God on earth to interpret scripture. Uh, and uh, these things are not made up. They are absolutely true. Uh, there, is, there is rarely a meeting of the General Conference where somebody doesn't stand to the pulpit and say, remember Ellen White said that we are the highest authority of God on earth. Think about that. True story. I have heard it in nearly every meeting that I have attended of the General Conference, and you will hear it every time that Ted Wilson preaches, any time that any of the vice presidents preach. The General Conference is a higher authority than the Bible. They can interpret the Bible. Ellen White is a higher authority than the Bible. So should this surprise us, Linda? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just before we get to um, Gerald, um, I don't think Clifford, we have heard from Clifford yet. So let's hear from him. Yeah, it's kind of funny that this would come up. And let me just, I want to frame my words carefully here. Um, this topic was chosen. And I could say that as the editor, here is my understanding of the idea. We want it Bible-based, teach the great controversy theme, which is very fundamental to Seventh-day Adventism. I, I think it was on here a couple of years, a while back, that I quoted Bill Loveless from uh, CUC, who was giving a talk on last day events. And I thought he gave one of the most powerful summations. He said, two things you need to remember, the dead sleep, and there's a great controversy. Okay, so... The, I will say that the bottom line is this is a Sabbath school quarterly about the great controversy, the theme, using the, the book as an outline, as an outline, but you will find almost when you see it, it will be almost all scripture most sabbath school quarterlies are scripture we have an occasion ellen white thing during the week and what i basically say to the authors build your case during the week scripture when you come to friday you some friday we have some ellen white because you got to remember, too, there are parts of the world where the only Ellen White they ever get is the Sabbath school quarter. And we don't want to send a message, hey, we don't use her at all. So I realized that I could just see the comments coming up. You all think I'm full of it and I'm a moron and an idiot and all the rest. I mean, I, I'm just telling you from there, this is how at least I perceive it as editor, that that's what we, we are doing with it. Now, whether I, that's the smartest way to do it, you could argue that, but it was a, it's a Bible study. There'll probably be more quotes from great controversy in there than would normally be, but that's the gist of it. So 
I mean, I've been editing the Sabbath School quarterly quarter of a century now. There has never been any attempt the Bible ahead of Ellen White. We got it. Nobody's ever. It's the. I mean, you know, El, yeah, Ellen White ahead of the Bible. I have nobody has ever come down and told me or said to me, you've got to emphasize Ellen White more. You've got to. In fact, when I took over, there was a lot more Ellen White in the Bible study guide. And what I think happened was they paid so little money. They paid, it was like $1,800 to write a Sabbath school quarterly. And I think what happened, the people, you know, they get under pressure. So how easy it is to stick Ellen White in there. I have even found myself at times when I've had to do, unfortunately, a heavy edit on a Sabbath school quarterly. It was very tempting for me just to go stick some Ellen White in, but I wouldn't do it. So there's probably, if you look at the Sabbath school quarterlies now, compared to they were 30, 40, 50, dec a long time, there's very little Ellen White in there in, contra in, in comparison. So anyway, that's all. I just thought that needed to be clarified. Whether you agree it's it. a good, whether you agree it's a good idea or not, that's, I'm, but it's what was, we were told to do and, but I think you will find it's a Bible emphasis all the way through. Anyway, voila. I, I really, I really appreciate worth, your clarifying. I, know I can tell the comments you think of. Hey, George. Good to, nice, to, nice to hear from you again, buddy. Thank you. Nice to hear from you. So anyway, thank you, Lauren. Thank I'm you. done. Yeah, I, I appreciate you clarifying that because you did tell me that before. And I did say that, that. I, I, I do find that. I, I heard that, yeah. Whether we like it or not, uh, the Ellen White authority tends to creep in over the Bible. The GC right. authority tends to creep in over the Bible. And you know sure. that's true, Cliff. But I will say this. Uh, uh, it could have been, I, I think your announcement of the coming quarterly that Linda read could have been phrased much more nicely yeah i don't even remember i don't think i even wrote it i don't okay. usually write those i don't usually write those probably looking back now i probably should have because that could be misunderstood i think it was fair enough again i'd have to even read it i don't even remember what was written but that that's patty fair tompkins, enough. patty tompkins wrote in the comments she said it would nearly need to reverse the order change the wording a little bit it did not to be, need to be stated in, in such a way that yeah. it sounded like uh, great controversy came first. Yeah. That could be fair. I'd have to go look at it. I don't have a ABSG in front of me. And if it is wrongly stated, it's my fault because I'm the editor and it's my responsibility what oh, goes in there. And if, and if I let it slip through, then... I'm going to have to eat it. And believe me, I'll hear it. Believe me, I get I'll it. hear it. I get it. That's what I'm, they a, pay I'm me an editor, big too. For. That's what I'm I get. I'm an editor, big too. I get it. Thank anyway. You. Hey, thank you. Sure. Yeah. I do, I do sure. want you to thank come Thank you for letting me explain that. I appreciate that. Please. I, I would love, love for you to come and teach for us sometime. Uh, Gerald, I want to get you in before we're out of time. So. Well, thank you. And... Um, uh, greetings to Terry, who didn't know me, but now he does a little bit better. And all of the rest of you who are part of my body of Christ. I mean, this is our church. Now, Lauren, I really appreciate the words you gave about me that I'm still in the church, and I am. But I want to suggest that perhaps how I'm reacting might allow others to make a choice other than to leave, although I think that many of you really do need to have left, and I, I respect that. Yep. I've chosen to stay, but as part of the reason that I'd give for my staying, let me read a verse from a song that I ended my youth Sabbath school with today. I know my friends are there to rest in the heaven's nest, 
You don't knock, ring, punch a hole, the doors wide open awaiting for your soul. You don't knock, just walk on in. Now, for those of you who don't recognize that immediately, that was sung by Tom Jones on a very interesting album of all gospel music called Praise and Blame. If you haven't listened to it, I recommend it. But that, that tune is where I'm coming to be about God's salvation. Now, let me explain that a little bit. This is I'll try not to be long-winded, Lauren, because we're running out of time. No, you're okay. I have been influenced for perhaps the last 35 plus years by another female prophetess. I'm guessing you have never heard of her, although you might. Her name is Leslie Jones Webster. Art and I know her dearly. She either wrote to me or talked in a phone call shortly after she had converted to, I think, a non-denominational evangelical church and chided me up and down for not accepting God's rich grace and thinking I had to continue to keep the commandments, including the Sabbath and about eating and all these things. It resonated because at the end of high school, our our chaplain on campus gave a week of prayer. And out of that came a, a resolution in my mind to say, I'm a Christian first and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Now that was a long, long time ago. But I've continued to try to follow present light and present truth as it's come my way. And I want to continue to spread that. Um, I add that religion gets in the way of this gospel. And, and I will parenthetically insert, we have a new pastor. He just preached his fourth sermon today. He's preaching about salvation. What is it? the good news of the gospel? Today's term, term, uh, sermon title was The Perfection Trap. And he preached on 1 John 2, 1. If you say you're without sin, you're fooling yourself. We all are in God's remnant church. We can choose to abstain. I'm going to stay in the Adventist mold because I can still influence their youth. They'll let me play tunes like I did today. I also played Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds, a direct quote from Ecclesiastes. I play Jesus Loves Me, one of the original love songs of God to a youth in most churches, not just the Adventist Church. I played Stay or Go by the Clash as an emotional response to tough relations. Everybody cries sometimes by REM. Emotions are real. And I told my kids, you're going to temp be tempted to be depressed or manic be in between and allow God and his spirit to preach salvation and I love you no matter where you go and you'll be all right. And I think you will too. I'm glad that Thank you're you. there for those young people and I hope they appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lauren, I do have a question. Sure. Um, first, I'll note that um, I've heard the preacher on the Breath of Life and other platforms literally say that um, all the signs for Christ's immediate return has happened. And as a result, he can come any minute, even tomorrow. And again, this is in 2023, right? Um, like like uh, Cherry and my folks, they had a place up in a, a place we call uh, John's Hall, Durham, which is on the northern side of the foothills of the Blue Mountains. And my parents told us that um, that's where we'll all run to when the Catholics and others come to prosecute us. They already had land up there and they said, no, as a little boy, I was really worried. Um, that's not the environment I would want to be um, grow up in, right? So so we see, we see that. 
Uh, my question is this. Um, for the fundamentalists, the three main fundamentalist religions, you know, Adventism, the LDS, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And of course, you know, they happen to, um, they were sort of created around the same time, right? In 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 the late, um, late 19th century. Um, they each have their own model of Christ's return, right? The parousia, they each have their own model of it. Um, are we unique in terms of the, Im the immediacy of that return or the, the randomness of that return compared to the other who fundamentalist uh, monotheistic um, um, Christian religions? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, the, the, three, the three that you mentioned, you're right, we have a lot in common with the other two. Uh, we all ar arose in the same era in, in mu from much the same uh, sociological factors. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot in common with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the, uh, and the uh, Mormons, uh, probably more than we generally acknowledge. Uh, as I said, the thing that is unique about us, for the Jehovah's Witnesses, it was the name of Christ. Uh, they had uh, they set a couple of dates for Jesus to return when Jesus didn't return. Mm -hmm. uh, that has pretty much uh, uh, gone off the uh, gone off their radar at this point. In fact, uh, the last thing I heard is very hard to keep up with what's happening to the witnesses because they refuse to release any uh, statistics or anything that's happening to them at all. They have they're very decentralized. And uh, so we don't really know what's happening, but the supposition is that the Jehovah's Witnesses are struggling. Uh, they're, uh, at least here in the United States, uh, churches are emptying a bit faster. Uh, two or three failed uh, comings of Christ has not helped them at all. Uh, the the uh, Mormons, by contrast, I, I've often said they're they're uh, for they're, they're the of the three cults they're the sexiest they're they're the best known they have the most interesting uh, stories to go with them they've got that little edge of the you know the, the people in northern Arizona and southern Utah who are uh, fundamentalist LDS and even though they say no we don't we don't believe in that they actually very much support those people who are uh, uh, polygamous. So it's an interesting group. We of the three are the ones who are most dedicated to the immediate return of Jesus. Just remember that. Yeah. Nobody else has that quite as front and center of, of the three American cults. Ours is the most dedicated to the return of Jesus. Uh, nobody else, everybody else has an eschatology. Our eschatology comes right at the front and center, Bob. And uh, by the way, we are probably the most dedicated to preparing for that time too. When I was a child, I've written about this somewhere. When I was a child, uh, we were at camp meeting and my grandpa and grandma, uh, one of the, uh, my grandpa was considered sort of a, leader in the conference. He was a, a big man and very, very uh, involved in singing and preaching and things. And um, <clears throat> one day he said, uh, Elder so-and-so, and I can't remember who it was, but it was one of the visiting speakers, is coming over to our cabin to talk to us. To us. And my grandma was so proud. She said, oh, that's wonderful. He's coming over just to talk to us? Yeah. So he came over to their cabin, and what he wanted to do was sell them a time of trouble hideout lot somewhere down mm -hmm. the mountains. And he was the representative for somebody. He, he sang, I'm gathering all the Adventists in this one development, and they're, they're selling lots, and they're building houses there, and all of us are going to be there to await the time of trouble. I, I have to say, I was proud of my grandpa and grandma. Uh, grandpa said, you know, 
I've been perfectly safe on a farm and far out in the, the wilds of North Dakota for all of my years. I expect that I'm going to be safe through the time of trouble out on my farm in North Dakota. I do not need to go. But the, the, the uh, pastor said, but this is the mountains. You know, you're supposed to flee to the mountains. These are in the mountains. Yeah. And uh, they said, no, we're, we're going to be perfectly fine. And of course they were. Uh, they died old and full of years, as as we say, on their farm in North Dakota, and they did just fine. No, no Catholics ever bothered them. Um, I, however, was very anxious. Mm-hmm. I had a notebook. There's a there is a uh, there was a a, a a area close to our farm, maybe about two miles away, that had a few mild hills and uh, it wasn't being farmed. It was in some kind of program where they got paid for taking it out of production. It was, it, but it had a few hills and I had a little notebook in which I drew how to build a cave at the edge of that, uh, there was a, there was a, a, a slough there, a, 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 a lake. It was uh, not fresh water, but there was a a little bit of a drop off. And I drew uh, diagrams of how I could make a cave and and, uh, hide it from the Catholics when they came hunting for me. Uh, My big problem was how to find water. There was no water, fresh water there. And uh, it was uh, what they, we used to call a salt lake or an alkaline lake because there was no outlet to it. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, this stuff is deeply... Clifford, you, you came into the church as, as an adult. For those of us, your wife came into the church, though, uh, she was raised in this fundamentalist self-supporting thing. Those of us who were raised in this, this was very much what we were immersed in. It was fear of the second coming. That's what we were immersed in. And I'll bet Clifford, I know I know uh, your wife doesn't like me very much, but I like her and I'd like to meet her. And I want to say, I think if she and I got together and talked, we would have a lot more in common than we would have different from one another. And so I hope to uh, to meet her someday, Clifford. Yeah, well, that's another issue. Wise can be very sensitive. <laughs> well, whatever. We don't need to get all that. But look, I, as I said, I never, I never, I grew up. I knew one Seventh Day Adventist growing up, and he was my dope dealer. Okay, the only Adventist I knew, I bought drugs from him. Okay. Then I got converted at 20. I'm serious. It's the only happiness I knew. <laughs> then I come into this message and, oh, yeah, I got brought in. I mean, I thought that Sunday laws were coming next week, you know, and I mean, I, I could I, I'll, t- I'll tell you a super quick story, which is funny. These Adventists did take me through Daniel to Daniel 7. Daniel 8, Revelation 12, 13, I see the role of Rome. So I, I, I'm not, I didn't, I'm not, I'm, I'm still eight months from joining the church, but I see the role of Rome in prophecy, which joking aside for a Jew who grew up under, you know, all the idea of all the persecution to see something like Rome condemned in the Bible. So I ate that up. Now, whether you agree with that or not, but I got all this new information. So it's it's the, it's the fall of 1980, and the eight, 1980 presidential election is coming. And I got this all this light from heaven about Rome. So people are out on the, the campus of the University of Florida, and they're talking. And I said, Ted Kennedy's going to win the election. And someone said, how do you know? Because I said, the Bible says so, okay? And I was excited because this was my first time preaching 
what I understood to be the three angels message. And I ran back to the health food store so excited telling them and they were I could not understand they were not that happy with me but the upshot of it is look that was in 1980 I'm not where you guys are at but I am definitely more sympathetic okay as the decades have gone yeah. by but I'd like <clears throat> to think I've been <sighs> Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay, you were taught it in an asinine way. And I don't think any of those people meant it bad. It's what they believed. Step back a little. Look at the biblical principles. Try to move okay. beyond. You know, you can throw Thank the you. whole thing out because it was taught to you. Thank well, you. Said Thank you. No, no, I, I, I understand. I understand, Cliff. I, I get it. You and I have talked about this. I think we need to. We need to get together and talk in person. Yeah, uh, Bob, love, yeah. Bob, thank you so much. I appreciate thank so you. much that, that you managed this uh, this mob of of uh, unruly people today. I think <laughs> we're going to have to quit, George. You, you talked already, so I I, I appreciate. Uh, that. But we're gonna we're yeah we'll we'll we got it. We got to quit. I don't like to go too long. Uh, I've got about uh, three or four people in the, the DC area that I have to visit. Cliff, you're going to be one of them. And I hope to have a chance to apologize to your dear wife and uh, goodbye, everybody.